The Working Preacher team holds you in prayer during this difficult time. God bless you for all the ways you proclaim the gospel, and may God be with you as you navigate this new way of doing your ministry. We believe that biblical preaching changes lives, and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. In this ongoing pandemic, many preachers may feel isolated, but Working Preacher is still there with preachers every week through the podcast and our website to provide support during this time. If you or a preacher you know depends on Working Preacher, both for sermon writing and spiritual strength, now is the time to support it financially. If you are already a sustainer, your increased participation at any level enables us to continue updating this resource to support preachers and lay leaders during this time when they need it most. We cannot keep Working Preacher up to date or even open without the generous support of donors. I am so grateful for your help. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for the seventh Sunday of Easter, May 24th, uh, 2020. Uh, the first reading is Acts 1, 6 through 14. The Psalm is 68, 1 through 10, and 32 to 35. The epistle is 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, and then 5, 6 through 11. And the gospel is John 17, 1 through 11. And it should be noted that this is the podcast, again, for the seventh Sunday of Easter. If you're looking for the podcast for Ascension, in case you like use the Ascension Day texts for this, uh, sun, uh, for this particular Sunday, you can find that elsewhere on the website. But in, if you're doing the seventh Sunday of Easter, it's the uh, high priestly prayer, which it's often called uh, in John, the first portion. Uh, I know I mention this every year, but it's, a, it's worth mentioning again that uh, this is a, a prayer that's the entirety of chapter 17, but it's broken up in the lectionary over three years. Uh, and what we get in this first section, and uh, you'll see the overlap next year, and I'm sure you'll remember what I have to say next year uh, in this moment, but uh, 17, 1 to 11, really uh, 17, 1 through 5, are uh, Jesus' uh, Jesus' prayer to the Father that uh, is, is really specifically a prayer for himself. He prays for himself and knowing what uh, what is uh, next for him. And the very next thing, of course, is crossing the Kidron Valley and, and to his arrest. Verses 6 through 19, there's a shift in the prayer. And, and I think it's worth noting that the majority of the prayer, that shift moves to Jesus praying for his disciples. Uh, with uh, the lection in, for today in verse 11, really entrusting the community to God's care. And so the majority of the chapter really is, uh, is for, you know, the disciples and what, and in, in, in trusting them to God's care in terms of what's happening, but also uh, beyond. And then what we get in year C is 20 to 26, which is also quite remarkable in that Jesus prays for believers yet to be. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a prayer that has these three parts and uh, that overall sense of what Jesus prays for, I think can be a model of prayer. Uh, and, but particularly in this first section, just noticing that, that, that there's a combination here of Jesus praying, praying for himself, but then making that shift in verse six uh, to praying for his uh, disciples. And I, I think, uh, as I heard this passage this year, I always say that it's, I think it's extraordinary to imagine that, that the disciples got to overhear Jesus praying for them. And one of the things that a preacher can do is 
uh, to put your parishioners, your listeners in that space. This is Jesus praying for you, uh, praying for him. You get to overhear Jesus pray. And uh, that's not true in the other disciples. And that's, uh, and, but particularly now, uh, considering the pandemic and the uncertainty of where we are, we're doing a lot of praying. Uh, we're praying for people who are sick. We're praying for uh, many different kinds of ways in which this pandemic has affected uh, so many different people. But maybe this is a point uh, in time to stop and, and remember that Jesus prays for you and uh, to sit in that for a little bit and uh, to take comfort in that. Uh, and I, I think that's a direction I would maybe go this year uh, in listening to this prayer once again. I love John 17. It's, it's uh, one of the things that saves this gospel for me. Um, not saves, but this makes it really. Ow. 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 I didn't mean like it's Ow. awful. It's just one of the things that like draws me to it. Like, how about this? Let me say it in a different way. If John 17 didn't exist, I would like John a lot less. Is that any better? If I dug out of the hole a little bit? Not really, but that's because okay. Actually, I, where for you? me, it's the opposite. So this is fascinating. No. Yeah. I was like, okay, I love all of scripture. Okay, I don't really love all of scripture. There's a few parts I don't love. I mean, I don't like uh, Obadiah. Uh, well, Obadiah is not as bad as uh, Ezekiel or Nahum, but uh, um, <laughs> anyway, this I, I was I, every year. I'm like, okay, can Caroline help me love John 17? Oh, maybe Matt this time. Well, here's you get Jesus finally bringing a lot of talk to a crescendo and talking about what in the world he's finally come to do. I know there's other places in John where he does that, but here it's on this big scale that's deeply rooted into his own relationship with God. And so uh, I love how John 17 ends basically with a promise that, that believers will share in the same love that Jesus shares with the father. That's to me, that's where the whole gospel finally just explodes in a good way. But here in, in, uh, in 10 and 11 verses 10 and 11 in today's reading, this idea that they may be one as we are one, that there is not just a relationship between Jesus and the God he calls Father, but there's a unity there with distinction. In a similar way, that's the kind of unity that we're called into, is this with one another, but also with God, a relationship obviously of distinction. I'm not God, but one where the intimacy is such that I'm caught up in the life of God and, and God is committed to my own life and my own experience. I just find that really, really powerful that the, 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 the unity Jesus talks about isn't just cooperation. It's an existential sharing of space that happens between me and the divine, which is, I don't know, that makes me want to come back next Sunday and hear more. I love this chapter as well, uh, and um, it's uh, one of my favorite verses is there, and that's 17.3, um, in this idea of eavesdropping uh, on this conversation between Jesus and, and the one he calls Father. And if we are those who bear the image of God, then we are reflections only of what we have seen, and we have now seen God in Jesus, as, as we hear throughout this gospel. And in 17.3, eternal life is described, not as something that happens in the future, not as something that is uh, uh, this unimaginable uh, pie in the sky. Uh, it is to know God and the one whom he has sent. And if that is what it means for us to be Christ-like Christians, to point to the Father the way Jesus pointed to the Father, that our actions of grace, of justice, of good, of righteousness, of kindness, of, of peace are glimpses of what God intends for all the world, what better way to be in unity with one another in whatever our circumstances of life might be. I, I love the promise of that verse. 
I do. I do too, Joy. I think it's 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 a verse that I talk about a lot when I when I do John for preachers and and for lay people to uh, because you know you want a definition of eternal life. Well, here it is. Uh, this is eternal life, and and I think it's a I think it's a really interesting and important verse as the seventh Sunday of Easter that uh, as, we, as we come to the close, if you will, of the resurrection season, although res every Easter is resurrection, I know that, but, uh, but that, uh, that the, re the resurrection uh, and that promise of resurrection at the end of the day is not eternal life. I mean, it, it, what eternal life is, 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 as you said, this knowing of God and knowing of Jesus and knowing God through Jesus and knowing in the gospel of John is, you know, not a cognitive uh, expression, but a synonym for relationship. And so fundamentally eternal life is here and now in this relationship that we have with uh, Jesus and with God. And once again, in a time of a a pandemic and some of the conversa conversations that I've had with uh, people over the last few weeks, uh, it, when, when those moments or those, uh, those patterns we have in place of maintaining that relationship with Jesus, going to church and, and such, but that relationship is intact. That's not, that hasn't, that hasn't gone away. And so I think there's an extraordinary amount of promise here. And then if you look forward to verse four, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Uh, this, this term of glorify is really quite simple in John. It's to make visible the presence of God. And so this is, this is what you have, what you were talking about. Then, then, then this is our charge going forward. Uh, we will be in, uh, in involved in the acti activity of glorifying, uh, glorifying God. And what that means is making visible the presence of God for all, so all can see God. And so uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable verse and one that, one that I think has uh, some really new and important meaning at this, at, in this period of, of our time. In this introduction uh, where uh, Jesus begins by saying uh, that the hour has come, the hour that had not come um, when um, uh, at the wedding, um, when uh, his mother tells them, you know, they're out of wine, where Jesus eventually does this grand gesture of generosity and hospitality. But that wasn't it. And, and it wasn't at the Feast of the Tabernacles where um, I think it's uh, uh, maybe about chapter 12 where the, uh, it says that his brothers and sisters didn't even get him. And they were like, well, why don't you go and do these miraculous things? And again, that's not the hour. The hour is here and it ties into not simply the work that Jesus has done, but the uh, uh, empowering of us the followers, the disciples of Jesus, to do that work of making God's God visible in the world. Yes. Um, Pressure's on, Rolf. Pressure's on. What do you think now? Uh, well, I think, well um, I think a couple of things. First of all, I do love uh, verse three, um, where it's, you know, that it says, um, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Um, so what I, uh, my advice to preachers is, you've, uh, so there's been several really huge ideas uh, uh, floated out there by Matt and Caroline and Joy, right? Uh, and so probably one mystery at a time. Uh, uh, an old guy once said that to my dad after my dad preached a sermon that uh, reflected both on the two natures of Christ and on the Trinity. And he said after the service, one mystery at a time, please. So, but um, I really like the idea uh, this time of, of that, that idea of glorifying and it, that is making the presence of God known or visible. And, and so uh, of course, then in the gospel of John, that is, that is um, the crucifixion is 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 the hour of glory so the ultimate 
uh, our of uh, the picture of what it means to glorify God, to make God's uh, grace visible, and to t- and to point about where you've seen that recently. Um, I've heard just extraordinary stories from my friends who are parish pastors in this time uh, of uh, extraordinary stories of people doing that, uh, of uh, of being the hands and feet of God and glorifying God and making God's presence known in acts of love and mercy and hospitality. And so I think maybe that's uh, what really would speak to me, uh, although that's, I have nothing against um, a picture of eternal life, nor do I have anything against uh, the intimacy of being one with uh, the Father and the Son. Those are those are beautiful ideas also. If that's what you do with the text you don't like, I'm okay with you, Ralph. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't like it. I said I didn't love it. <laughs> you know what I that. love? I love X1. And you... Shocker. You, you, uh, we had it for Ascension, and now, I, once again, but a few more verses added. There are a few more verses added. So, you know, you've, you might want to read from verse 1 going forward if, you, if you're into adding verses, but definitely go through 14. Uh, it gives you a chance to name all the disciples, which is always fun, but it also gives you a chance to get a sense of who this community is uh, beyond the twelve. Uh, this group of 120. And you could even go on a little bit further and ask what they're doing. I get this a bit. Prayer um, uh, as well, that the, the church begins as a waiting church, right? The, the first grand act of the apostles is to sit and to wait, um, to be patient until God has disclosed what God has promised to disclose. And uh, and that's obviously difficult, but it's an important part, I think, of the book. That's it's about to tell a real rollicking story, but starts in uh, you know, these ten days of of maybe confusion, uh, certainly obedience, patience. But it's also uh, I don't know. I, I one of my favorite sermons I've ever preached on this, where I try to make the case that what the church is doing here is paying attention which is really what pastoral ministry is about uh, at, at one of its, if you boil it all down, it's about a couple of things, but one of them is about paying attention uh, to the world, to people, to texts, to God, uh, and being able to, as a result of your careful attention paying along with others, then to name things and to be present in the world to bear witness. But bearing witness has to start with paying attention uh, at some level, I think. And here's a nice way of of, of talking about that, plus all the great Ascension stuff that we talked about in the other podcast, which was brilliant, by the way. One of our best podcasts. Well, I, I uh, love this uh, verse 14, too, in terms of the, uh, the, in, you know, the inclusivity of, of, what, of who, these are, who these persons are who are gathered and all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, which is a major theme in Luke, but together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. And so I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to do some reconnecting of Acts and Luke, which I'm not sure, uh, you know, I think we think people know that Acts is the second volume of Luke, but I'm not sure that everybody knows that. People and so, love learning that, by the way. They love it. What's that? People love learning that. They can't get enough of Yeah, yeah. And so what would happen if you took this back, you know, go back to chapter eight, verses one through three, where you get Susanna and Chusa and and uh and then the women who are at the tomb. And so this the the uh the constancy of the of the women present um in this as well. And uh that really uh I think um uh, would be again, a way to tie the Gospels, but just homiletically, the, uh, the importance of the entirety of, of the witnesses who have come alongside Jesus throughout, throughout, throughout his ministry. And it's, and it's these people that will take that forward as well. And, uh, and so, uh, and it's, you know, women are not often <laughs> mentioned in terms of groups of disciples and and uh, so I think it would be a, a good opportunity for a little bit of um, hermeneutical correction or 
uh, feminist leaning into um, into into the impact this passage can have for uh, the breadth of of God's understanding of what uh, or of what Acts understanding or Luke's understanding is of what God has been up to in Jesus. And what this uh, opening question is, where they ask, "How uh, um, uh, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom?" And all of the echoes that come down that that says, uh, "After this, you will receive power to be my witnesses." And the you to whom is being addressed is this group of people, but we also can hear the echoes of the prophet Joel that said, "The new thing that God is doing will be." To, to give voice uh, to old and young, men and women. And, and so this is what the restoring of the reign of God looks like. Again, we are the witnesses to the works of God made known through Jesus. Yeah, so you do, yes, so you do Luke 8, uh, 8, 1 through 3, and then I needed to look this up, but Luke 23, 55 and 56, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. So we have those, you know, those are verses that you could just kind of, uh, you know, pass over. Oh, yeah, okay, but uh, but we get to this place in Acts and in, in 114, and you uh, you then those those verses you can't pass over them anymore it's i like joy oh i'm sorry i keep talking over people today i, I like joy that you mentioned the the new thing going on here and, and again to emphasize that that's part of what ascension is it's to <clears throat> it's to open up the possibility of newness it's to sit on the cusp of this new thing and so you've got again i mentioned this in the other podcast but that question right is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom to israel uh, Willie James Jennings in his commentary on Acts describes that as, as a temptation to nationalism that he contrasts with what we see happening in Pentecost, which is not the old vision of a nation, but now a new way of being Israel in the world for all of those who are gathered at Pentecost, who are multi-ethnic, who are scattered across the, the quote-unquote known world, and who are brought back into relationship now. And what's in store for them is not a new nation that mimics the nations of the world, that mimics the empire, but what's in store for them is now a new community that exists kind of moving in and out of the empire, but it has its own set of definitions of who it is and who it belongs to. So it's a, it's, the argument is it's a new way for Israel to understand what it means to be Israel in the world, not necessarily in an anti-Jewish kind of over against way, but in a way that's, that's talking about how God will now recreate something new in the midst of this imperial landscape. And yeah, I love that. But, and I'm glad you, you mentioned the anti-Israel because it, we, we do have to be aware of the, of, the, of the temptation to make it that that reading leads to uh, anti-Jewish and anti-Israel um, expressions uh, that the church both in... Uh, in its liberal and its in conservative um, current um, current realities, uh, you know, a renewed anti-Judaism is popping up on on the right and on the left. I just heard this week from a Jewish friend about, for instance, a new Danish Lutheran translation of the Bible that um, that in the New Testament it replaces Israel always with the, any reference to Israel with the Jews, and it's. Uh, it's a longer story, but it's um, it's a terribly anti-Jewish um, reading uh, of it. So I, while I, I, I want to stress that I love that reading, um, but the, the implication could be that then um, the Jews who are not part of this new, you know, uh, new the way, um, you know, they're just longing for that old kingdom of David still, you know what I mean? And then. Yeah, that's not his argument, though, but I, no. I get the point. I, I know that, but it, but as you pointed out, it just it, we have to be wary of that always. So I forgot to do my history lesson, and in 1844, uh, we had uh, Samuel Morris sent the first telegraph um, uh, message, and the message was, "What hath God wrought?" I think that's the question that we've got here. And it's not anti-Jewish. 
it is the presence of God made known in all the world. That would be a good sermon title. What hath God wrath? That's it. <laughs> what was the answer? What was, what was, you know, coded back to Samuel Morse? I knew you were going to ask me that and I didn't look it up. <laughs> I, don't th I don't think anything was coded back. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. I think it was rhetorical. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> All right. Psalm 68, man, riding on the clouds. Ghost Riders in the Sky. What do you got for us, Rolf? Uh, I, I, this is, uh, I would point you to Clint McCann's fine commentary on the website. Uh, it's, uh, this is probably the oldest psalm we have in the Psalter, and it is full of impossibilities. Uh, that is, uh, uh, things that are impossible to interpret, probably because it's so old. And uh, so anyway, it's, uh, it's a nice accompaniment uh, to, uh, as a liturgical response to the reading from Acts. All so right, and it. now... Uh, well, I love what McCann says, that, that, it's, uh, that the psalm belongs to uh, the lowly, or maybe he's quoting Mays there, I'm not sure, but um, there's something about the psalm that, that speaks to this desire to see, or to to describe God in these particular terms, or perhaps in some over against ways in which people's neighbors were understanding who God was. But anyway, I like no, that. I look, uh, he may, he might be my, uh, my favorite, uh, Psalm scholar. He's certainly in my top 10 and, uh, and he's uh, able to do wonderful things with difficult texts, including this one. No, he does. He, yeah, he says, right. He says, uh, the song belongs to the lowly who in the midst of the powers of this world remember and hope for the victory of God. And I love the quote which is from Oscar Romero. Um, this is a criteria for knowing, knowing whether God is close to us or far away. And I'll stop there to, to draw people to look at the, the rest of the commentary because it is a good one. And then we have our last reading from the first Peter. We've been That's a pity. Too bad. I uh, know. It's uh let's have a time of silence and mourning. Uh and Rolf is holding up. Look, we've run out of time. So uh no. <laughs> Uh, but yes, our la we've been working through First Peter, uh, and so there's some, there. I think that there there will be uh, some resonances here in this you know this last section, and of course the ending of the letter uh, with regard to some of the language that takes on a different kind of meaning uh, in our uh, the our pandemic situation, uh, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal, steadfast in your faith. Uh, the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. Um, and this is not to, you know, uh, to bypass that, but there is the sense of uh, God, you know, Christ himself will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. And so maybe this is a passage that we use liturgically uh, this 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 uh, Sunday of in terms of that uh, that kind that kind of promise of language of expectation of of fiery ordeals and suffering, but uh, but at the end of the day, uh, God has the power and the glory and the grace to support you in all of it.